Hello, my name is Rich Howard, owner of Architectural Builder Supply. This video is to go through how you would originate a key for a new system using an HPC Blitz machine. In this video, what I need to originate the key for is a Yale, a typical Yale um, PARA keyway. When we originate keys here, depending on what key system we're needing to originate keys for, it dictates the key machine that we're going to use. When it comes to Yale or pre-System 70 Corbin Russwin, etc., there are times when I'm going to use my HPC 1200, my Blitz. I'm going to, with my X and Y axis, originate the uh, the key that I need. And in this case, we're doing a level two system, so I'm going to need a master, and then I'm going to need change keys. I will cut one each of all of those keys on the Blitz, and then I will use, for me, I'll use my Rytan RY200 to duplicate them. So this video is to show you the part of originating the keys on the Blitz and the steps to go about doing that. So let's first figure out what it is exactly that we're going to need to assemble. Let's do that now. All right, so since we're gonna use a Blitz machine, what we've gotta start with is figuring out um, what code card you need and what cutter you need in the Blitz machine. So, you know, there's certainly going to be different ways to come up with this information. Um, you either, you may know what is in your um, Blitz machine in terms of cards, uh, or you may not. I don't. I mean, I'm assuming that it's going to have the card that I need but I, I don't know that it does. So let's see what we've got. Here's our Blitz machine. We've got the manual. I don't know if the cards are listed in the manual or not. I know that the cards are a deck-150 is the part number for the... Um, deck-150 is what's included in the machine that I have, and um, that is where I would start to figure out, do I have what I need? So this doesn't help me a lot uh, in the sense that it doesn't, well, it appears to be alphabetical. We're going to start with uh, what I think is section four out of the key blank catalog. Maybe it's not, but I immediately recognize that this is um, alphabetical. So y Yale large pin is what we're going to need. C57, that's my code card, and I need a CW14MC as the cutter, and I think that's what I have already installed in the machine. Let's see if a CW14MC is what is included with the Blitz, because if it's not, I might have trouble. I may not have the cutter. Um, yeah, okay, so right there. So all I was doing was a control F in the manual, finding, could, uh, search. CW14MC is the cutter used for most standard large cylinder keys. The machine is delivered and set up with the CW14MC. So, I know I've got a Blitz. I know it comes with the C57 card, and I know it comes with and set up with the CW14MC. So unless I've changed the cutter, my, my cutter is already going to be installed, and I believe it is. So let's now take a look at the code cards. Before we do that, let me show you another way that sometimes works as well. Finding this information was a bit convoluted. I know where to find it because I know the website, uh, arguably better than, let's say, you might. But you could always click on the manufacturer's logo here, get to their page in our site, then go to their website. And from here, you can click on products, then key machines, scroll down to your original Blitz. Um, so looking at this, Blitz manual, code card reference. So you, you'll you have to determine if your card is included or not, but you'll, you'll have to look up your machine. I know I've got the deck 150 in mind. So this is the code card reference. This is depth and spacing data. So Yale is gonna be down in here. Let's take a look at that. And let's just control F for Yale. Okay, right, right on. So I know I'm doing what they call, what, what HPC calls large pin. C57, Yale large pin. They don't have a punch card listed here because there is no code card apparently for the PCH1200 machine. Another place where you can find these depth and spacing, oh, actually that wasn't depth and spacing data. That was just a list. 
On that manufacturer's page, I have depth and spacing data by manufacturer. Now this is really handy. Control F for Yale, you'll find it. And we're gonna be looking for something that's called large pin. I'm just scrolling through here to see a description that matches something that I believe it's going to be. Oh, Yale Large Pen right here. Yale Large Pen. Depth and spacing data 882. That's just a number. CW14MC. AEB Supply. So I don't see a, a Blitz card reference here, so I'm wondering. Aha, yeah, I was in the wrong area. I know I'm doing a 19 thousandths increment, so here we go. C57, CW14MC, that's my cutter. Now, all of this is the depth and spacing data, and what they're giving you here is the on spacing, on spaces. Space one is the distance from the shoulder of the key, the shoulder stop, to the center of the first cut, and then to the second cut, and then to the third cut to the 4th, to the 5th, to the 6th, to the 7th. You can do Yale up, you know, 5, 6, or 7 pin. What you'll notice is this is 165 thousandths. If you add 165 thousandths to this number, you'll get this number. If you add that to this number, you'll get this number. If you add that to this number, and so on, you get the point. Then, of course, the spa the uh, depths. The depth is the distance, it's the root depth, it's the from, it is, it is the distance from the bottom of the key to the bottom of the cut. So if your effective plug diameter is 0.5 inch, which I believe that it probably is with Yale, minus 0 0.320, you'll have 0 0.180. So for a zero cut, the length of that pin would be 0 0.180, and so on. And you'll notice it's 19 thousandths increment, 0.320, Minus 19 thousandths is this number. Minus 19 thousandths is this number. Now, why are we subtracting the number? Because we're doing the root depth. The, sh the shallowest cut is a zero, which means the root will be the largest number. So think of it in reverse, I suppose. If you're thinking about the length of the pin, don't think about that, because what we're showing here is the depth of the the let's start over what we're showing here we're talking about here is the amount of material left on the key not the amount that you've cut off so that's how you interpret this so let's switch back to the camera view and search for our code cutting key if you are enjoying this video please click thumbs up or like and also please consider subscribing to our channel let's move on to the rest of the video okay so now I've got my deck 150 that came with my machine okay so what I need to do here now because I didn't take the time and sort them out and put them into the binder I'm gonna go through here and look for my C57 Aha, there we go. So, the bottom line is, it would, would have been wise to have um, organized though these. There's my card, okay? Let's take a closer study of this card. Let's switch to a different camera view. Okay, now here's the card. This card is incredibly valuable in the sense of when you're cutting, when you're cutting keys on your blitz machine, and if you use a blitz, you, you already know, what you really need is to be working with your dials on your X and Y axis, on your, your, you know, your spacing and depth. However, everything up here is, is everything that is on that depth and spacing data. So first of all, the card will always tell you what cutter you need. Okay, it's gonna tell you
your depth and spacing data, reference number, your maximum adjacent cut specification, five. It is a two-step system versus, uh, if you're familiar with Corbin Rust, when you've got System 70 and pre-System 70. This would be, of course, System 70 if we were making that sort of um, connection. Any notes that are important? Some blitz machines may not reach the seventh space. Well, we're doing a five pin system here, so I'm okay with that. This gives you all the depth and spacing data for your depths and your spaces. It tells you what your increment is, 0.019, uh, and your space increment. And all of that was in the information we just went over. It shows you what the profile needs to look like for your cutter in terms of well, that gives you your, um, that is your, sho the, two th the, two th the point two inch is from the shoulder to the center of the first cut that is giving you your successive spacings. It's giving you your depths. It tells you what blanks you can use. Standard keys, most sectionals, sure. It's just it's telling you that it's going to cut the standard material. Okay. So we've got our card. The next thing to do is to take a look at our machine. Let's do that now. Okay, so what we have here is our blitz machine, which I'm going to grab the camera and attempt to gingerly show you. Okay. Standard, uh, standard blitz machine. Now the issue is I don't recall what cutter I have on the machine, nor do I know if you can see that very well. I'm looking for the cutter number. I can see that it's right here. And it's not the right cutter. CW90MC is what's there. I doubt that you can actually see that. You won't be able to see it clearly. I was cutting Corbin Ruswin before, is what it seems to me. Yes, I was cutting Corbin Ruswin before, and this machine requires the CW90MC, which is why that cutter is in there. Now that's actually a very good thing, and we're gonna I'm gonna put my Yale card inside of the machine. You're just gonna slide that right up into the top of it. When you're sliding it in to the machine, you want to be sure that as you slide it in, let me show you what was happening. I'm trying to slide it in, and I'm hit, I was hitting one of my needles. So what I did was I simply rotated the needles so that I could easily slide the card underneath the um, underneath the needles. So, as I was about to say, this is actually a great example of um, showing how to change this cutter because that's a reverse thread. Really important that you know that. Now I have my CW14 MC cutter here. It says CW14 MC right at the end of my thumb. So I'm gonna have to take out the CW90 MC and put this tool in. Yeah, okay. So what I end up doing on this is I have a box wrench. I have these tools in the box in my blitz machine at all time. I have a half inch box wrench which I put here so I can lock my cutter in. And then I have my socket here. And I'm gonna, what I wanna do obviously is I want to loosen this. The, the interesting component, however, with this, as I had said earlier, it is a reverse thread. So what that means is when you think that you're going to tighten something you're actually going to loosen it. So let's demonstrate that. If you've not hit subscribe yet, we would very much appreciate if you did, and hopefully you're enjoying this video. Now, let's get back to it.
rather ju than just showing you how to change a cutter, what I would prefer to do is show you where the data is. Because the first time I did this, it didn't occur to me that it was a left-hand thread. And I broke the factory supplied box wrench because I was spinning it in the wrong direction. Attempting to loosen it when I was actually tightening it to, tightening it to where I destroyed the box wrench. So let's find the manual. So search HPC Blitz in my website. And right here, 1200 CMB. Manual is here. I'm looking for the index. Here it is. Changing cutters on page 18. Well, let's go to about page 18. So it lists different cutters in this area. That's very interesting to know. This isn't a review of their manual, but just know that it's really valuable to be able to get to this. Cutters. Listing the different cutters. Page 18 is changing cutters. Now what's important here is turning off the machine, obviously. Hold the cutter shaft fast with half inch uh, open end wrench. I, I called it a box wrench, that's how I know them. Or the number one wrench supplied, and that's the wrench that I destroyed initially. You're gonna hold that box wrench there. Don't move, that, that stays still. Just hold it still. The important part is the three quarter inch socket that I've put on the nut you're going to turn that clockwise. You don't have to worry about left hand or right hand. You just have to know clockwise. What's interesting, when you turn something clockwise, you're generally tightening it. But this is a left hand thread. So when we turn it clockwise, we'll actually be loosening it. Loosening it. So let's, let's demonstrate that. All right, so we have our, I've got my box wrench. And this is what I'm going to hold tight. I know that I've got to turn this clockwise which means if I'm just going to hold this I'm going to hold this wrench I've got to rotate this clockwise so I can tell my box wrench is backwards so I've got to rotate my socket clockwise to loosen I'm going to hold I'm holding this firm and I'm going to push down on this because that would be left hand okay there it was it wasn't very tight so to demonstrate that, turning it left allows you to loosen or clockwise. That will come off. I'm going to leave my box wrench in here. Just leaving it in here. It doesn't have to go anywhere. I will, I will need it again in a moment. Very importantly, I'm going to put my CW90MC into its case. This tooling, especially if you buy the carbide version, is not inexpensive. I'm immediately going to put this away. Now we're going to load our CW14MC. Right below my thumb, CW14MC. My nut is going to go back on, but now I've got to turn it in a really unusual sort of orientation to the right to get it to tighten, which, is no, which would normally be tightening it. I'm going to reverse the setting on my socket. I'm just going to tighten it by turning this. I'm holding this fast. I'm turning this counterclockwise. I don't need it to be very tight. It's not going to slip, but just just one ratchet, so to speak, tight. The tools I will put back. I just leave a cutter in the tool because I, I can't predict what I'm gonna end up needing it again for. So now I've got the cutter and I've got my code card installed. Now the next thing I need to do is to create my bidding list. I need to generate my level two list of progression. So what I'm going to do is I know that this job is always going to be level two. I know that it's never going to grow larger than about the um, eight or nine, I forget, I have to look, eight or nine change keys. The UL standard tells us that we have to uh, plan for at least 50% expansion. 
which means in total position progression, I really only need to worry about or to use two chambers in order to progress two chambers because that would give me the number of changes that I need incorporating in the expansion that best practice would tell you to provide for. I'm going to do rotating. I'm going to do a rotating constant. Uh, it, it is a more secure method of, uh, of uh, progressing biddings. It will use far less master pins. It will therefore create many, many less unintentional uh, change keys or ghost keys. It's a very small system, no big deal, but rotating constant serves the needs of a level two system so well that using total position progression should probably not ever be considered for a, for a level two system. Um, and if you were to dive quite deeply into the science of total position progression versus rotating constant versus the matrix method, um, you will be quite uh, very likely so interested in the science behind it that you will absolutely want to learn as much as possible. And if that is the case, you're going to want to, you will certainly want to seek out education through Aloha and then other locksmiths that you can communicate to about books that are written. And there are several authors that are, I can immediately think of three or four that should be required reading for this. But we're going to do rotating constant. It may not be a big deal, but we're going to do that through this. Let's, let's, let's go back to our little camera and create a uh, rotating constant level two system. If you are enjoying this video, please click thumbs up or like, and also please consider subscribing to our channel. Let's move on to the rest of the video. All right, we're going to create our biddings now. Um, I, there, there's eight or nine change keys. Okay, I'm just going to, we'll progress uh, 16, in which will give us our 50% expansion. Um, this is a Yale Para system. I've got a Kaba Ilko Y1 or a 999 blank here. I'm sorry, that's a bit out of focus. 999 Y1. Okay. Let's do this. We're gonna do a we're gonna do AA. We're gonna do one AA. We're gonna do two AA. AA is the master. You can call it anything you like, but standard industry conventions would say use use AA. That everyone's gonna every locksmith who's a locksmith will very likely understand what you're calling out there. Someone can look at that and say, oh, okay, well, it's a level two system. It's a level two system because numbers come before letters. That's how we know it's a level two system. So our master is AA. This is the twelfth change key under the AA master. Is you know is how that would work. So this is a Yale system. So those cuts are going to go from zero through nine, um, and you do like moderate um, variation key numbers. You know the science of creating a good master key is not. I'm not going to get into that in this video um, because I've covered it elsewhere. Is the bottom line. I like to have and. Most people do, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's scientific. A rather shallow cut here, rather than a very deep cut here. I'm going to go with a three, just a random number, really. Um, it's shallower. I, I'm going to want to use um, the shallowest cut in the system. Actually, not necessarily. I'm going to use a shallower cut uh, eventually. So we're going to go with three. Let's go with um, six. Let's make this a, oh, we also have to know our max, which is on the code card, it's five. We can't have the adjacency greater than five is what is what that really means. Three, six, let's go with a one here because that, that doesn't exceed our max and it gives me a very shallow key and there's a reason for that. Now let's go with a four and let's go with an eight, okay? The reason of the shallow key is I won't use um, 
in total position progression, you wouldn't be able to take a change key necessarily and cut it into a one because you would make all of the cuts in that position deeper. That's what it is. So total position progression is we're going to need to move two positions is what I is what we're going to plan on doing. And what that means is you'll have five positions. X, X are the positions that you rotate. The Y's, the X, X is what you're going to rotate. The Y's would stay constant, but what happens is not constant. Let me, let me back that up. This is what the first key would look like. Then you would have X, Y, X, Y, Y. Then you would have X, Y, Y, X, Y. Then you would have X, Y, y y x and what i've done is i've rotated this first x through all of the different positions that has given me four different combinations and what i'll end up doing here is i'll take the master key three six one four eight and then i'll have my next change key this is a y forgive me it's going to be because x is constant three then this will be the next possible cut in the system. Except the problem is the next possible cut would be an 8 if we were going ascending, which would then, when I brought the constant of the 1 down, would violate the max. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make this a 4. I'll go shallower. So it's 3, 4, 1, 4, 8. That's my master. That's my first change key. I have rotated the second position. In the example here, this is actually draw, written wrong, x, x, y, x. Oh no. Yeah, x, y, y, y. Okay, this needs to be x, X, Y, 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 X, Y, X. This will have to be X here. And this will have to be Y. I've written that a little scary. Bear with me one moment. X, X, Y, X, Y, X, X, Y, Y, X. Okay, I had it right the first time. Let's write that a little bit cleaner. X. Y, Y, X, X would be my third position. So now what I'll end up doing is rotating this column, except it's important to explain all of the positions that didn't, that didn't get rotated are the same biddings as the master key. So I rotated the second chamber but every other key, therefore, would be the same as the as the biddings in the master key. That's the principle of rotating concept. Uh, the the principle of the rotating constant. In my second change key, that means I'm going to rotate this third chamber because I, I I rotated my second chamber. So that means that this is going to be okay. Let's get into a uh, progressing our biddings. Okay, what we're going to do here is. We're going, to rotate, we're going to use rotating constant. We're going to rotate one position. Um, the science of rotating constant versus total position progression versus the matrix method. That's different. That's a different lecture, I suppose, uh, and I've covered it elsewhere. So the first thing we're going to need to do is come up with a master key. We're going to call it AA. In the industry, that would be a very, that would be the common typical uh, designation to apply to a level two master. Okay. So if you if you tell a locksmith AA, they know a lot about your system because that's an industry standard term. I know that I've got to generate nine change keys. Per our best practice, we're going to allow for 50% more. We're going to go. We're going to we are going to progress 16 change keys. Meaning, I'm going to write the biddings down, put the biddings on file. I'm going to indicate what I've used on this job, and then I'll know what spare biddings I have. Okay. So. Uh, one AA, 
2AA, 3AA, 4AA, 5AA, 6AA, 7AA, 8AA, 9AA, 10AA, 10 Now there are a lot of books in the locksmithing industry. As I had said, there's a few that are, in my opinion, require, required re reading and to have them on uh, your bookshelf as well to refer to later. So we're doing Yale. It's a two-step system. There is 10 depths in the system. I'm going to select a key. It's a five-pin system. So it, this happens to be a para five-pin is what it is. Yale. I'm going to put the date here because I'm literally going to take this and scan it into my profile so that I've got my biddings. The master key I'm going to use is going to be a variety of um, numbers that are shallower and some that are, you know, one or two that are deeper. It's five pin. I'm going to use three, six, one, four, eight. I used a three here because I want to use a shallower cut near the bow while they're while I've been told there's not a lot of science to actually tearing a key here, I have seen it happen through a lot of use. So I'll opt for a shallower cut near the, uh, near the shoulder stop, leaving more metal here. So I'm going to use a 3. I could have used a 1 or a 2, but a 3 is fine. Now in total position progression, we would end up progressing or changing the bidding in every chamber by adding, which would require that we add a master pin to every chamber. Well, we're not going to do that because it's not necessary to add all of those additional master pins and those additional ghost keys uh, or incidental, um, unintentional uh, key, key interchange is what it is. We're going to progress one chamber. And what that means is we're going to have a key and we're going to have P, C, 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 C. We're going to progress here, and we're going to hold these constant. C for constant, P for progress. If you recall, our, our master is 36148. So I'm going to write that here, 36148. I'm going to progress the first chamber. Progressing the first chamber is going to leave me with 5, 7, 9, uh, 1. I'm picking two steps away from the key that we're using because it's a two-step system and that way it allows me the maximum amount of changes. You can automatically see that I can get four change key, four changes out of each chamber and I've got a total of five chambers. So four times five. I'm going to get plenty of keys out of this. Plenty of keys out of this. Okay. So what, what does our 1AA key become? Well, 1AA becomes 56148. What does 2AA become? 7, I'm sorry, yeah, 76148. 96148, 16148. So all I'm doing is, like the odometer method, cycling through the first chamber. Total position progression, again, would require that I change these chambers, but in rotating constant, I specifically must keep them constant. So, this rotating one chamber gives me these four changes. What's the next pattern? The next pattern is going to be C, P, C, C, C. Again, 3, 6, 1, 4, 8 is going to give me uh, 8, 0, 2, 4. I'm progressing the second chamber, which is going to give me 3, 8, 1, 4, 8. 3, 0, 1, 4, 8. So let's write those. 3, 8, 1, 4, 8. Um, 3, 0, 1, 4, 8. 3, 2, 1, 4, 8. See, that's a hallmark of, a, of sloppiness. And that's not good when you're writing biddings. Take your time and make them neat. Don't, don't be like me. 3, 4, 1, 4, 8. Now I've got 8 changes. What's the next pattern? 
that we're going to do. We're going to go to 16 changes because that meets our expansion requirement. The next pattern is going to be C, C, P, C, C. 3, 6, 1, 4, 8. I'm only writing that up there to help me figure out what I'm progressing. I'm going to progress the third chamber, which is going to be 3, 5, 7, 9, which is going to give me 3, 6, 3, 4, 8, 3, 6, 5, 4, 8, 3, 6, 7, 4, 8, 3, 6, 9, 4, 8. Now I've got 12 changes. My last pattern, because I'm going to stop at 16, would be C, C, uh, sorry, C, 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 P, C, 3, 6, 1, 4, 8. I'm going to rotate this column. It's going to be 6, 8, 0, 2. My biddings are going to be 3, 6, 1, 6, 8, 3, 6, 1, 8, 8, 3, 6, 1, 0, 8, 3, 6, 1, 2, 8. Now I've got 16 changes. You'll note I can rotate one more position to give me another four changes. What's interesting is we actually might need those. We're going to find out right now. What I mean is this. M, A, C, S equal 5 in this system. We can't have a value between two numbers greater than 5. 5 is okay. Greater than 5 is not okay. We don't violate that anywhere here. We do violate it here. That number's no good. We've got an 8 next to a 1. We don't violate it here. We don't violate it here. We're good 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 here. We are not good here. We are not good here. We are not good here. So out of our 16, I've lost 4. So now I'm back at 12. I have to rotate the last position to give me my expansion. Let's do that. CCCCP. Let's do that to make sure that we're not going to have trouble. Our last position is going to be CCCCP36148. It's going to be 0246, 36140, 36142, 36144, 36146. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. So now I've got uh, back to 16. I've got all the changes that I will need for this job. I've got all of them that I need. I lost four because of the max violation, maximum adjacent cut specification, but my last progression was good. So I've got 16 changes. I'm going to record all of these. I'm going to notate on there what I used when I'm cutting my keys so I know what's left over. This is rotating constant for a level 2 system, for a very small level 2 system, but this is the most secure way to actually achieve this, according to me, which may or may not be accurate. Correct. So, now, my biddings, I'm going to transpose my numbers onto my permanent record, which I'm going to write these four uh, here. 3, 6, 1, 4, 6... 36144, 36142, 36140. And I will fold this over. So now we're seeing only the biddings that we're going to record. Then I'm going to take my biddings from this sheet, my worksheet, and I'm going to just fill them in from top down. I'm going to do that right now. 56148. 76148, 96148, 16148, then 30148, 32148, 34148, um, then we go to 36348. Three six five four eight three six seven four eight three six nine four eight three six one six eight. Now I've got 
the nine biddings I need, plus 50% expansion, we are good to go here. You do want to double check your math. If you make an error in here being sloppy or whatever, it, it will absolutely expose you at a minimum to responsibility of the system failing, meaning the guy in Unit 3 can get into Unit 2. Turns out he comes home and he's been drinking all night. He walks right in and there is a lady police officer sitting on her couch watching her favorite TV show having, you know, a, a, a bowl of ice cream because that's what she does on Friday nights after dinner. She's a lady police officer. She pulls out a gun and shoots the guy. But he dies. Okay? And the reason that we talk about this being important is because it's an actual true story. And that is, uh, that happened, oh, I, let's just say about 2010 that happened. Um, and it's not, it didn't happen in a stand your ground state. Um, and that police officer um, ended up having the book thrown at her is the bottom line. He's dead. She went to jail. Uh, her career is over. And it's all because of unintentional key interchange. And I don't know what happened to the locksmith who did that work, but you can bet they got to the bottom of how his key operated per unit. It was a uh, multi-floor building. He thought he walked up three flights of stairs. He only walked up two. And he put his key in and he went right in. And that's getting something down here wrong is the bottom line. And it was probably total position progression to begin with. So there's master pins in every chamber. So, um, okay, let's move on with the project. Let's start cutting keys. If you've not hit subscribe yet, we would very much appreciate if you did, and hopefully you're enjoying this video. Now, let's get back to it. Now, before we proceed to cutting the keys, I wanted to show you what the client provided me. And this is their keying schedule, basically. And we can look at this and we can decide how best to incorporate this into our own standard sort of nomenclature. So I had said earlier eight or nine uh, biddings. It's clearly eight uh, that we're going to need. So what the client has over in description, and this is the reason I go over it, it is because this is something like what a client will provide you. A very easy breakdown that someone who's not a locksmith, and quite frankly, anyone can understand. What is it? What's the description? Uh, the client happens to be a she. Uh, added a row here for the master key. This was uh, brought in later on when the client originally asked for a quote. It didn't include a reference to a master key, but I quoted the project that way because it would be expectant to have a master key. So the client needs double cylinder deadbolts, single cylinder deadbolts, double cylinder deadbolt for in outswing, and in-swing and in-swing doors. Now what we're doing um, on this project is we are using the Yale 112 rim locks. And the 112 series, basically all four of them are here. There's single cylinder and there's double cylinder. There's double cylinder for in-swinging and double cylinder for out-swinging. There's single cylinder for in-swinging and single cylinder for out-swinging. What's gonna change on these locks other than the obvious double cylinder and single cylinder is the strike type that you would need out swinging versus in swinging. Really, uh, really important to know that. Let's see if the installation instructions tip us off in terms of the strike type. Now they show the rim strike that's here for an in swing door. Um, let's take a look at the catalog. Yeah. Let's, let's click on the link to the manufacturer's page, then we'll fire up the catalog that's here. We'll do a find function on our keyboard, control F and then 112, and we'll have to cycle through a little bit, and then we find it pretty easily. So what they're saying here is with the 112, single cylinder, if you want a flat strike, which would be more appropriate for an outswinging application, you would add an F, a 112F, F for flat strike. Here's your double cylinder, same logic, add the F for a flat strike. Now, what does the flat strike look like? 
uh, well, I don't really see that they have one here, but I can illustrate the difference for you. Um, if you have a door, and it's swinging out like this. If your door is in swing, this would obviously be the inside. You would then use the rim strike that's there, which would go, which would go here. And that's the strike that's shown. Your lock body. is going to be here. You can have single cylinder or double cylinder, whatever it is. Now, that's an in-swing. If you happen to have an outswing, what really needs to change? Well, if it's an outswing, what's going to need to change is where you put the strike. You don't want the strike on the outside where someone can tamper it, tamper with it, because your lock body would have to be out here. So now, in this instance, the lock body is going to go in here, because you want the lock body on the inside. In this instance, you're going to have a strike. Well, I mean, we're obviously exaggerated here, but you're going to have a strike, a flat strike that's going to reside in this sort of area here. Okay, So on an outswing, your strike's going to be on the inside of the door, and it's not the same strike that would go out here is the bottom line. So that's that's the difference. So that's what the client is pointing to when they're telling us in swinging out swing. What they're really telling us is which strike do I need to pack for the project? And that's that's what we're getting after here. Uh, I don't unfortunately I don't see where they have a fo uh, an image of the um, out swinging strike that's here. But it will mount on the soffit of your frame, no doubt, is where that will mount. Yeah, interesting. Okay. So, let's move back to the client supplied keying schedule, uh, which is here. Um, direction, in swing, out swing, out swing, in swing. Okay, uh, the client has given us a column of where they name the different openings that will get these. The client has said, I need X quantity of locks for the application. So over here, we need two locks for, the, for a courtyard. We need seven locks for medical, nursing, and waiting. Down here, we need two for flex, one for doctor's office, etc. What the client's then given us is a key number, zero through eight. That is like me saying AA, one AA, two AA, three AA, four AA, five AA, six, seven, eight AA. Obviously, medical, nursing, and waiting is gonna be keyed to this same group, same group, and same group. And the final column, the client has said, I need you to provide me with X quantity of cut keys. She wants, the client wants four masters, six of the 1AA, six of the 8AA, etc. You get the point. So then we translate that all into our own language. Now I know what we're doing. So what we're going to end up doing is switching to a different camera view. I'm going to cut one each of the master. Um, and then duplicate, I'm going to originate one each of the master, I'm then going to duplicate it on a different machine, and then you'll know exactly how I would do the rest of these keys. Okay, so let's do that now. Okay, so let's originate that first key. So we're going to cut 36148, which, which is our master. We're going to take one of our key blanks, we're going to simply load it into the machine, Is going to be done right down here. I open that up. My carriage is as far out as it will go. And as far over as it will go. Sorry. At this point, my flip stop is going to come in. Okay. There's a micro switch down here. The machine will not start unless you reset your key gauge. Okay. My blank is going to go in. Okay. 
I've got my key blank in there. Everything looks fine and dandy with that. And we're going to cut 36148. So the first thing that we're going to need to do is move our X axis to the first position. Okay, and that's this wheel over here. So we're going to draw, and watch how the carriage moves as I move the needle. As I move the needle towards the first position, that's one, is what that says. I'm going to center it right on one. Okay. That's moved the key into the first position. Now, if I were to move this over to five, you see how the carriage moves. Now, I'm way further away from the stop, the shoulder stop, than I was before. So I'm going to put this back to the first position. I'm going to center it really nice. We're centered. Then this wheel controls my depth. Okay, My first cut is a 3. So we're going to get the machine plugged in. Okay. The power switch is back here. My cutter is free. My key gauge is down and making that micro switch close. I'm on one. I'm going to move my depth needle. Oh. I'm going to move my depth needle to three. Watch the needle. We're going to get right to three and stop. Nice and right at three is where we are. Now we're gonna re we're gonna pull our carriage back. We're gonna clear everything. We're gonna change our position to the second spot, to the second position, the uh, second chamber. Centered the needle nicely. We're going to six now. Our depth. Right at six. Pull our depth back out. Okay. Move to the third position, the third chamber. Centered nicely. We're going to one. A nice shallow cut. Move to the fourth position. That next cut's going to be a four in the fourth position. By the way, your eye protection is, is absolutely mandatory with cut key cutting. Fifth position, that's going to be a deep cut. That's a four. Let's go all the way to four now. Uh, pardon me, it's eight. I said four, I meant eight. Got our carriage pulled back. We're going to bring our tool, our carriage out. We're going to turn off the machine. We're going to loosen our thumb screw, take our key out. That's our AA key. Now, what I like about this AA key is that I've got a, I've got a one cut here. And um, that's going to prevent a lot of keys from being cut into a master because I've got a one cut here. 
It could have been a zero cut, and that would have prevented uh, any cut change key that had a cut deeper than zero, or any cut, basically, uh, in that position from being turned into a master. That's an unusual uh, thing to consider about recutting a change key into a master, but um, when you can incorporate that safety into your system, you would do so. Um, ouch. I am not uh, excessively concerned over someone surreptitiously recutting a change key into a master. Uh, this application uh, doesn't, this client's application is nothing that um, has critical storage that's happening. These are gates, actually, is what they are. Frankly, they're fences. There's things that someone could climb over uh, should they need to. Uh, or, or someone could climb over. So uh, we, uh, we're, we're, we're not creating the system so absolutely bulletproof according to best standards. Now, you saw how long it took me to cut this one key. I'm now going to take my duplicator and duplicate the keys. It takes a long time to originate keys on a blitz machine because you are literally dialing the space and then the depth and you're doing that for every chamber. I've got to cut 56 keys. It would take a long time to cut them on the blitz machine. Um, and then the problem with that is exactly where I get the needle for my spacing and my depth is going to vary inherently. So I like to take this over to the duplicator because my duplicator being calibrated to tolerance, I'm going to get good, really good copies of this every single time. So let's move on and do that now. If you are enjoying this video, please click thumbs up or like, and also please consider subscribing to our channel. Let's move on to the rest of the video. Okay, then what we're going to end up doing here is finishing up this video by duplicating the uh, AA key. Okay, so again, rather than originate the keys, we're going to duplicate them. This is my uh, tool of choice, the Rytan RY200. It is heavy. It is built very well. Uh, it stays in tolerance very well, and it's easy to adjust it. Um, I like it that when I, uh, I like it because when I'm cutting keys, the carriage doesn't tend to move on the bench at all because it's it's heavy. It's robust. It's also uh, backed by a company who is absolutely expert when it comes to uh, not only making good quality machines, but being able to support you from a technical support perspective. There was one time that I called Rytan and a client needed to switch from a punch cutting this type of conventional key actually, I believe, to interchangeable core. And the gal that I spoke to, there were seven parts needed to convert the machine. She was able to tell me the parts from memory one after another. And that's just really an expert command over the subject matter, as far as I see it. So, let's duplicate a key. So what we're going to do here is we're going to get our key brought into our carriage here. I'm going to get it set up. Forgive me. We're going to Get it set up on our tip stop. We've got our key away from the cutter. This is the trace dog. Your original will always be here. If you accidentally put this over here, you're going to destroy the client's key. That's another true story that I will I can tell you at some other time, I suppose. So we're going to take a blank that we have here. We still have our tip stop folded over is where we should have left that actually. Our blank will go in. Uh, I'm going to turn the machine on. What I do when I'm cutting keys is I will make, yeah I didn't like that. I think what happened here 
because our tracer dog moved. Yeah, that slid on us a little bit. That's not... Well, it's probably not a big deal if we haven't cut our shoulder. So let's take a closer look at what we've done here. Also, cutting the key uh, in hand is anything but ideal. It's also important to remember which is the master, and I've marked the master so I know. Yeah, I'm going to say the amount of movement did remove the width of some of the artifacts here. If you look at the artifact here in the original, there is a slight difference. But the only thing that would really be different is how wide the cut is, which is not ideal at all. Uh, so we're going to mitigate that problem and recut the key uh, is what we're going to end up doing because... We're, if we're making the cut a little bit wider than it needs to be, and some of our keys are at a max of 5, maximum adjacent cut specification, you can't have that key cut technically very slightly wider encroaching into the cut of the next space. So that's what we're going to end up doing. Hey, we're going to end up uh, recutting that key. But anyway, we're going to duplicate them on the duplicator. It's a lot faster than the uh, originating method. If you have any questions on how to originate a key for your key system, please feel free to reach out to us. And thank you. Thank you for watching. And if you've enjoyed this video, please click thumbs up. Please subscribe and maybe even send the video to someone that you know. Thank you.